Hi, I'm Pete, and welcome to Just a Few Acres Farm. It's a rainy day today. The weather's turning good for spring, but there's some wetness to be endured beforehand. So I thought I would take today to revisit something that I talked about in a previous video, and that's inflation and all of our input prices going through the roof. And I wanted to look at that from a deeper level than just what's on the surface because I think that a lot of what's going on in discussion these days is really just kind of surface stuff. It's not looking at the core issues behind why we're seeing all of this inflation. And I also have some thoughts on what the future looks like as far as the cost of doing business as a small local sort of locally focused farmer versus the trends in the world and how we're all going to recover from this kind of pickle that we're in right now. Here's my central hypothesis behind the whole thing right off the bat. It's that we're living in a connected, crowded world that's governed largely by efficiency. And the best way to illustrate that is to compare the world of today to the world of a hundred years ago. And I'll tell you what, the biggest differences are in the connectedness of that world a hundred years ago and its efficiency. So, getting across the oceans was really kind of a hard thing to do even a hundred years ago. Not a lot of people did it. And the consequence was that the economies in the continents, the different continents, were a lot more independent than they are today. Their own supply and demand pricing mechanisms were largely contained to their more local situations. And even more so, things like food production and manufacturing were much more community-based. So you had a lot of smaller producers on a sort of continental basis producing things for that country or that part of the area that they live in. The consequence of that is that manufacturing and food production was less efficient because you had duplication of things going on. So if you have 10 small farms producing the same product and you roll them all together into one larger farm, you've eliminated a lot of duplication of labor and equipment and you've increased the efficiency in producing that finished product, right? There's examples of that all around us in the world right now. That was the world of 100 years ago. Less efficient, more resilient because you had more manufacturers and farmers producing the same thing so if one or two went out of business had a problem you had others that could cover their production output easier than rather than one big one and you had less people traveling across the oceans to connect the world economy together and less stuff being shipped across those oceans. Now let's look at the world of today compared to that world of a hundred years ago surrounding three topics and it seems like things always come in multiples of threes. Resiliency, efficiency, and centralization. Those three things have changed our world dramatically versus that world of a hundred years ago. Efficiency is the amount of work we have to put in to produce any given product or foodstuff. Efficiency's been on an upward trend for a long time now. Resiliency, how well a system responds to varying conditions during its operation, how well it responds to external forces coming and kind of shaking up its situation. And centralization, which is related to efficiency. Increasing centralization results in greater efficiencies because you have less duplication of materials, plant, and labor. So you see these three things, efficiency, resiliency, and centralization are deeply related, right? Uh, efficiency is related to centralization and less duplication of effort to create products and food more cheaply. And resiliency is a product of centralization and efficiency because the more efficient you make things, it's kind of like a race car growing Cornish cross broiler chickens. The more you put external pressures on an efficient system and a centralized system, the more likely it is to not respond to those pressures as well. This is exactly what we're seeing. The more efficient and less resilient a system is, the more it's prone to failure under conditions that aren't optimal for the operation of that system. So what comes along? 
the pandemic comes along and changes the operating parameters for the system. All of a sudden you have labor shortages, you have factories closed for a little bit or a long bit in some cases that interrupt the kind of on-demand supply of materials and one of the functions of that those systems becoming more efficient is they're carrying less stock. So an automaker doesn't want to make a thousand automobiles to sell a hundred a month and have 900 sit for months. As manufacturing gets more efficient, it tightens up its supply to match demand more tightly to carry less stock and to incur less overhead costs in that. It's about competition between manufacturers to create the same thing at the least cost. You have a system here that's prone to failure given any external pressure that's not common. So here the pandemic enters the discussion. Think of think what you will of the pandemic. My opinion is something like this was bound to happen, whether perceived or real. When you're living in a connected world with people traveling back and forth worldwide every day with animals being shipped around the world, things like viruses and contagion spread faster, they mutate quicker. It's bound to happen. It's just the law of probability that these things are, are destined to happen. And we've designed systems that don't cope very well with that because we haven't seen that at the scale that we just saw it. Come on, Ezra. Geez, the pigs are arguing and Ezra's asking for attention. Here's what I see happening now, and this is just a, a consumer's point of view. And farmers are consumers too. I still have to go to town and buy stuff. I have to go to the home supply store, the auto parts store. We do have to get some groceries. And this is what we're seeing. We're seeing less local availability and poorer service for the things that we're shopping for. So as a product of the labor shortage, we're seeing less skilled service people. I particularly see that at the auto parts store, by the way. And what's the response of folks to this further lack of service, which has been a trend over years? Lack of service is another product of efficiency. The more efficiently and with the lower paid employee that you can staff a place, the more efficient your product is as far as your bottom line and what you charge the consumer anyway. Things are moving even more towards central distribution and production now as a result of this whole shakeup we've gone through. So there's more online ordering of things rather than going to your local provider. Think what you will of that trend, but I've seen this pandemic as a convenient reason for companies to provide less service than they did before. Oh, there's a labor shortage. We're putting in more self-checkouts. Oh, there's a labor shortage. Go online and buy what you want there instead of going to town and buying it. That scares me as much as anything because I don't see that trend reversing. That trend, that trend toward efficiency hardly ever reverses. Now let's look at the product of existing in a connected world with such efficient transportation networks on material prices. It's a global system and it being a global system is a product of capitalism because you, the people that make things want to sell that thing for as much money as they can. And in a global market, that means they're looking all around the world because they can ship it easily now. Petroleum is a good example. I believe, and my facts are a little old, I, but that the U.S. manufactures or extracts enough petroleum to supply all of its own needs. But petroleum isn't priced on a supply and demand basis in the U.S. alone. The companies that are extracting that petroleum are looking at the worldwide market. So if you have a ripple like, and it's more than a ripple, over in Europe right now, and petroleum prices go up, they go up here. Even though supply hasn't changed here, they're selling on a worldwide market, which is the way capitalism should work. Our food supply functions according to these same global pricing considerations. I'll take my local example. We had a great growing here last year. We had plenty of rain, corn, soybeans, oats, wheat. They were all fine. And I'm buying my grain here. So you would think, oh, there's a good supply, price should be low. No. 
because we exist in a global market. There were things that happened. There was the drought out west that affected grain production out there and capitalism all boils down to supply and demand much of the time. And things that happen around the world affect my purchase price of commodities like grain here. So for better or worse, being in a connected world means what happens overseas really affects what happens to me here. So we live in a global market where what happens globally affects what we pay in our own locality. And I don't think there's any going back from that for a bunch of reasons. Number one, it hurts manufacturing or people that are making things ability to sell them for the best price on a worldwide market. You're hurting, you're controlling capitalism in a way that I don't see a, a, a beneficial outcome too if you start tinkering with the mechanics of supply and demand. The other thing is that you're hurting the resiliency of a very crowded world. In other words, if we have things like a major drought in the US or there's a major drought overseas, the ability of those places to draw from a global market to take care of that temporary shortage is really important. It evens out the peaks and valleys in production of any given thing, not only food but other things that are needed on a consumer market. I see lots of things going on in the world that scare me as far as trends go. These big trends. I'm not so focused on political exigencies and those sorts of temporary nature things. And the way that we cope with it is by combining the good with the good. There's a lot of good that's happened through advances in technology and efficiency and centralization and we benefit from those. And there's also a lot of good in providing for yourself as much as you can at home to help guard against the ripples that we've seen going on in the last few years. And I'm standing in front of the wood pile because that's, this is a real good piece of insurance. Full freezers in the garage are another good piece of insurance. I'm not convinced that our centralized systems are responding very well yet. And I'm not sure whether I have faith that they will. Because efficiency is a mindless force. It's not like there's anybody behind it. It's just efficiency. It's dollars and dollars. Dollars in production, dollars in sale. And efficiency as a sole determinator of the character of our world is really ruthless and brutal because it doesn't take into consideration a lot of other important factors. And it doesn't deal very well with long-term threats like energy supply, like um, food supply. It just looks at real short-term criteria. And that's one of the reasons it responded so poorly to the sort of extreme conditions that have been going on for the past few years. I don't know what to do about it, except to ensure a better measure of our own self-sufficiency. I don't have any illusions about things returning to the way that they were 100 years ago, and certainly the way we farm is not an example of a desire to go back to that state. There were a lot of problems with that state. It's about combining the new with the new, as I said. So, I'm trying to get below the surface on these things because most of the arguing, arguing and finger pointing I see is kind of surface based and I like to take a deeper view of things. Anyway, I hope this video was informative and thanks for hanging around for my rambling <laughs> and I'll see you next time.